This is Andrew. Uh, thank you, representatives from the um, Uganda Police Force. Uh, our sister from Jelos, thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, my colleagues, the acting deputy and the op operations manager, as well as Evelyn and other colleagues, thank you so much, uh, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to receive you in our office premises today. One of the major concerns across the world is the ratio of police to citizens. And what we're doing here today is bridging that gap. And it is a delight that we have the uh, Uganda police force on, uh, uh, always available to partner with UN women in terms of addressing gender-based violence. I would like first and foremost to thank you all for taking out the time to prioritize this event. I recognize the commitment of Uganda Police Force to combating gender-based violence in all its forms, and I applaud your efforts thus far in enforcing the laws, particularly through the concerns of ending violence against women and girls, and also for improving access to justice for all, especially for women and girls. Although there's been a lot of progress and a lot of results recorded by Uganda Police Force in, in the years past, we applaud that progress that has been made in the right direction. However, we are not there yet. UN Women in Uganda is committed to drive for ending all forms of violence against women and girls. We recognize that to end violence against women and girls, it is critical to ensure that women and girls have access to justice. We emphasize that access to justice is an essential ingredient for effective, accountable, gender responsive justice delivery and for justice institutions. And also for the realization of the rights of women and girls, which cannot be denied and is enshrined in the constitution. As you all already know, violence against women and girls has been on the upsurge in Uganda, especially during and after COVID-19. And this has been really exacerbated during the lockdown period and all the um, operations around uh, COVID-19. Prevalence of physical violence experienced by women and girls stands at a whooping 51 percent 51 which is almost 20 or, or more than 20 percent higher than the african average at uh 37 percent so a little less than um 20. this violence is perpetrated in both public and private spheres when you think of 51 percent that means half of the women in uganda must at some point in their lives experienced uh violence against women and girls. This is uh, phenomenal. In spite of the efforts that, we, that have been made, a lot still needs to be done regarding reporting, we were just discussing in my office, regarding protecting women and girls, investigations, and provision of survivor-centered GBV case management services, as well as securing full accountability for GBV crimes. We know the culture in Africa. We know the culture in Uganda. When, for example, there's a case of GBV that's been perpetrated by a relative, we know the pressure that is put on the complainant to withdraw such cases. We need to disabuse the minds of a, 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 a community level, the parents of, of the complainant, the parents of the victim, not to withdraw such cases. And we need to help such cases to, uh, to address that pressure. Additionally, the prevailing transportation constraints significantly affects the service delivery potentials, such as the arrests of perpetrators, evidence collection, and handing, handling investigations, as well as accessing victims for the rapid response that is required in GBV cases. These challenges make it extremely difficult to provide full protection 
for victims and to bring the perpetrators to book. It is on this basis, therefore, that we have uh, uh, been able to work with our donors to put together the funds to purchase these very valuable assets, which include three forensic vans, soccer kits, and cameras. We are confident that these assets will greatly boost the efforts of Uganda Police Force, to, as well as NGOs at the community level, because there's a very strong collaboration between UPF and, and NGOs and ordinary citizens, so that evidence can be collected scientifically from the scene of the crime before such gets contaminated by either human error or other elements. It will boost effective enforcement of ending violence against women legislation. It will boost our efforts to end harmful practices. And it will boost our efforts to address sexual reproductive health rights, as well as facilitate women and girls' access to justice in Uganda. On behalf of you and women, I reaffirm our continued support to, uh, to the mandate of UPF for the enforcement of law and order, especially for laws to end violence against women that provide for the protection, prevention, as well as accountability for GBV crimes. Uh, I had had some requests that I made in my office, but let me add some officially. One of those that I mentioned was that uh, we would like to see strengthened capability of the Uganda police force in terms of data generation and harmonization and um, um, putting forth the evidence to protect women and girls. Now we have others uh, I would like to list as follows. So number two, continued handling of GBV cases from a survivor-centered and trauma-informed approach. Why is this important? I know that at community level, many times the victim becomes recriminated. That person becomes the, 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 uh, the criminal because the, the, the police uh, challenge her, that, oh, why did you put on that dress? Or why did you do this? That's not the case. The case is the perpetrators need to be brought to book. No matter what the, whatever situation this victim must have found themselves, the issue is that um, the mindset change at community level is critical. And also with the police, we want them to have that survivor-centered approach so that the rights of the victim can be put ahead of other things. Continue to prioritize GBV cases perpetrated against women and girls, considering the fact that preventing, mitigating, and responding to GBV is a life-saving priority, and it is essential to the well-being of women and girls. During the COVID lockdown, UN Women had to work with uh, JLOS and other actors and other NGOs to um, advocate for GBV cases to be identified as essential services uh, at community level because it's about life saving. It's about uh, protecting women and girls and ensuring that they have the well being uh, to uh, contribute to national development. And number four, continue not only to allocate, but also increase funding and human resources to effectively handle GBV cases. So number one, data. Number two, uh, the approach, which is survival-centered. Number three, to uh, recognize GBV as a life-saving uh, service. And number four, to allocate and increase the funding to um, uh, handling of GBV cases. Once again, AIGP. I want to thank you on behalf of you and women and on behalf of our partners. Uh, we thank you for the great work that you're doing and we look forward to seeing greater progress and impact for the execution of your mandate. Uh, we stand ready and we stand committed to continue to give you that strong backing as it concerns ending violence against women and girls here in Uganda. Uh, I want to pledge our continued support and thank you so much for uh, being here at short notice. Thank you very much.
This is the head of office here at uh, UN Women. Um, the acting director of uh, forensic services at the Uganda uh, Police Force, Andrew Mobiru. Lucy, my friend from uh, Justice Law and Order sector, I understand it is changing the name. Um, senior management or managers at UN Women and also the Uganda, the Uganda Police Force and you, our friends from the media. First and foremost, I want to bring you greetings from the Inspector General of Police who received um, your invitation, your kind invitation. And um, because of other commitments, he has not been able to be here physically. But he delegated me uh, to come and represent him here. He does recognize your commitment and the support towards a crime-free crime society, but most importantly, a society that is able to get justice once a crime has been committed. And to achieve this, we need to be more, 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 more than partners even. And I want to thank UN Women over the years, over the years, for supporting um, the Uganda Police Force. I, I joined police headquarters in 1994. And when I joined, there was a small desk I used to sit with the, with the officer at police headquarters. I had a desk in charge of uh, community policing, and she had a desk in charge of uh, child and family protection. She was called Helen Ariek. Unfortunately, she, she passed away. And from that humble desk that she had, that we had, has now become a huge, huge, huge program. And thanks to UN Women. Because, because you have been there and I have been seeing that up to the time when I became head of the Department for Community Affairs, but also now the director where this um, office is anchored. I want to thank you specifically for the donation that we are about to receive of three customized um, evidence vans. Uh, my friends from the press, you have heard. They are called customized evidence vans. Um, and not the drones. <laughs> 18 scene of crime officer kits, 18 soco cameras, DNA consumables, and others as they will tell us. This donation um, will go through to the Uganda Police Force, will go through the Office of the Directorate of Forensic Services who will enhance crime scene investigations through proper processing of crime scene and timely collection and transportation of evidence who exhibits from different stations to the forensic laboratory for analysis and timely reporting of the findings which will enhance the justice system. I think one of the, the good things from uh, people who have what we call um, institutional memory, when this office starts, madam, there wasn't anything like an effort or capacity to collect evidence from the scene of crime. We all depended on an officer called an investigations officer to be able to collect evidence. Their perceptions were even very bad. Um, I remember I was an officer in charge of a station called the Entebbe, and one of the victims was told to show evidence, to show an exhibit on how she was raped, how she was defiled. It was very pathetic. And, and if somebody has that kind of negative attitude, then how do you correct the, the, the evidence? Now we have reached a stage where we have kind of different stakeholders within the institution of the police, all geared towards um, not only protection, but also to being perpetrators of GBV to justice. 
Two, it's not done by one person, as I have said. For example, now there should be no justification or no excuse. There should be no excuse, actually, for us to lose cases of gender-based violence. There should be no excuse <clears throat> because we have people who now collect the evidence at the scene of crime. And that, for me, that is very, very important. Then you have been, we have been training people who investigate these cases. But also we have trained a very good number of officers throughout the whole country who not only interview, but first of all, who provide counseling, who provide the environment that we are talking about, that the survivors, you, because you talked about a survivor-centered, the survival-centered approach. And I can tell you this is work in progress because you have helped me and other civil society organizations to train different officers at their own districts and their own stations on matters con con concerning this. And the other one is that uh, we've been able now to work with the, of the office of the, of the DPP, or is it called ODPP, yes. um, who are very, 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 you know, um, when it, come, when it comes to cases uh, that, that taken there by the police, and, it, uh, and these are GBV cases, the kind of uh, attention and support they give us is, uh, is unprecedented. And I want to thank that office uh, for, for doing that. Of course, we don't forget civil also society. Our partners. Exactly. <laughs> we don't forget civil society organizations, those that have put up reception centers they are the, the, at the police station. But there are those that have put reception centers outside the police station. Recently, I went to Kamuri and we visited this reception center where victims of GBV are, are placed for a period until when it is considered safe. And, um, and I want to tell you, the, if, if this is not a survival-centered approach, then what is it? Uh, we, we, we need to support this and encourage more and more civil society organizations to, to support the police in terms of now giving a holistic approach towards this problem. We must bring down cases of GBV and we must end violence against women and, uh, and, and, and girls. And this kind of support is very important. UN Women want to thank you for coming handy. The other one is that the DNA consumables have enabled the Office of Forensic Services to process so far 56 cases. They've just started doing this, but uh, so I'm happy about processing. By processing this, it means they have been able to get evidence. They have been able to, uh, to process that evidence until when it is consumed by the, by the investigators. Yes. And uh, so this is uh, something that we must be, uh, uh, that w we must applaud them for. They have collected a total of uh, 500 samples, specimens, 500, in, in all cases of uh, sexual gender-based violence um, and, uh, that have been reported uh, to, to them for analysis. Now, I think I'm going to task my officers, especially those in child, um, those in uh, community policing to do a lot of sensitization mm -hmm. because it is through sensitization that uh, more I, I believe these 500 cases is a drop in the ocean yes. because when you look at the annual crime report of last year they have it when you look at that annual crime report cases of sexual gender based violence are higher mm. than the kind of uh, evidence that we have been able to provide them yes there are cases that do not need to to have evidence go to them. Direct evidence is where we, call, we have direct evidence. But we need now to do a lot of sensitization so that we can now have this office be, uh, to be more robust, yes. but also to decentralize to the regions, which they have done. They have regional circles, but they also have the district circles. But the district circles also need to be supported. And on this, I call for more support to anybody, uh, to UN women, other civil society organizations, people uh, who espouse um, uh, and, and support and defend the rights of women and girls, please come up and we support um, 
investigations, the area of investigations and correction of evidence and exhibits at the, at the, at the scene of crime. Yes. The purpose is, the purpose is to, to place, to place <coughs> the offender yes. to the scene of crime. Yes. The offender may be in Ushenyi, Greater Ushenyi, where I'm born, <laughs> and, the, and the offense was committed in Moroto. But we want to bring that person from Bushenyi and place him at the scene of crime mm. in Moroto. The only way to do it is through forensic evidence. Yes. So this is important for all stakeholders who are out there. Let's support the police uh, when it comes to that. Now, the pre-configured containers or pre prefabricated, I think they are called prefabs, yes. Um, will be stationed um, in uh, Moroto, in Uguru, mm -hmm. and in Nagarama. So those prefabs, um, uh, inf uh, the unit commanders will be told that they will be placed where we have planned them to be placed. Yes. And nowhere else. There is a reason why uh, the officers, the managers, reach the, the 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 actual stations where they should be placed and uh, we are going to monitor this yes. including myself i yes. travel a lot in the country and i will make sure that uh, i i follow up this yes. and the conducive space office space for investigators during interviews of victims and witnesses of sexual gender based violence and all other related cases and provide space for storage of exhibits corrected from scenes of crime Pending transportation to the laboratory. I think this is very important. That uh, the laboratory may be here, but I think it is the 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 the, uh, the preservation from the scene of crime yes. that is very very important. Mm. Uh, and the, and this has come in handy. And how I wish we can have a unit per district in in Uganda. I think we shall reach there. Yes. Now UN women. Um, has supported the Uganda Police Force through the Director of Forensics for training on correction, on preservation and storage of forensic evidence and management of SGBV and violence against children at the district level where these officers were trained, including health medical officers who examined the victims of SGBV, the desk officers for Section and Children Offenses Department, the Child and Family Protection Desk Officers, the Probation Officers, and the RISA, the, the regional um, uh, the state attorney. The Uganda Police Force wishes to extend its gratitude to UN women for the tireless efforts and support towards fighting impunity of sexual gender-based violence and protection of children. Your donation contributes to our journey towards a safe and secure society, and we are very grateful. I assure you that these donations will be put to good use and for purposes for which they were donated for UPF um, uh, to, to, to UPF um, and we commit ourselves to follow up all SGBV VAC cases um, in the most committed and, uh, and, and professional manner. Let me end my remarks by uh, looking at the, the, where they fall, the four issues that you talked about. Uh, uh, first of all, strengthening the data capability of, of, of the police. This is, uh, I, wish, I wish Maureen was here, but this is the area which they are doing, not only in child and family protection, but also in forensics, in CID. And, uh, and now, I, I, when I look at our statistics every year, I see that we are becoming better and better and better. Um, so, data correction, and data generation and coming up with proper statistics um, is very important. And I think that's how your office also, your office must be, must be having this data for you to be able to plan. And this data, I can assure you, will be coming timely because sometimes we delay. You come up with the data in April, no. Yes. We should be giving you proper data, but the data that is also timely because we need to time your... 
you are you are you are are they financial years yes. because if we don't then we get a problem mm. how would you support us mm. when we don't give you data in time even jeros they have been complaining about that we have been trying to improve and i hope this time by january maybe something like january 15 we should be providing that okay. data i said on on top management and we shall do that um this includes the data of the girls that became pregnant um, from 18th of March to the time when um, um, the curfew and, and all this was removed. I am I'm, I'm told that we have basic data of 500,000 500, in the country uh, for the girls that uh, unfortunately we are um, impregnated during the during the lockdown, lockdown. but uh, I can assure you that uh, I have been talking with my colleague Moviru here we are now going to send um, targeted information to our uh, to our commanders and units all units and we are going to ask them to provide the data as much as possible and this data is not only the cases that are being actively investigated no we are going to ask them to provide the data of cases that were reported. Mm -hmm. Reported cases. Because it is through reported cases that you get the actual, yes, yes. The, the actual story. Because sometimes these cases are not followed up. Mm. And as you are right when you say that the pressure in Africa, the pressure of the victim to withdraw the case by through culture and all this. So we are going to do that. Continue, we shall continue handling the, survi uh, the, the survival, using the survival-centered approach, which I have enumerated, I will not say again. But uh, prioritizing GBV cases and, uh, and, uh, and having, uh, um, uh, classifying them as life-saving cases, yes, this is true. We, we must continue to classify GBV VAC cases as life saving cases because we've seen women and girls not only die but their life changes to to the to the to the worst um, um uh, if, if we're talking about rights of people rights of women and rights of girls for somebody now to have life negatively impacted upon probably for the rest of your life mm. is uh, last last month you can advise me we saw a woman in Kayunga, she hanged herself and hanged her children. Yes, Kayunga. Yes. Now, when you reach, when you reach a point of uh, somebody um, taking her life and taking the life of the, her precious children, we know what children mean to a mother. Now, for her, first of all, and you know, a child does not hang herself. Mm -hmm. So she must have gone through a very gruesome exercise of taking the life of one, mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. and then herself. This was so, so, so sad. It was so sad. So when we talk about classifying this as life-saving, we are not only talking about the victim herself, we are talking about the victim and her. Uh, the people who depend, depend on her. Who depend on her. Yes. And for me, this is, uh, this is very important and uh, we shall carry out that message. Lastly, we have put our own um, uh, funds, our own funding. Um, I was briefing you when we were here that um, last year alone, I moved to so many districts in the country. Um, and even this year, we have uh, cascaded funding, our own funding into our activities. It may be a drop in the ocean, but I can assure you that we shall be in 13, about 16, I think 16 districts. We shall go back to the districts that we are to. We shall visit Guru, we shall visit Kamuri, we shall visit Mbare, we shall go to Hoima, Masaka, Rira. We shall go to all these places. But we're also going to look at the implementation of diversion guidelines. These guidelines have not been put in place. We don't know whether people are still stuck in their traditional way of doing things, but we must divert especially children from uh, going through the normal processes of, uh, of, um, of uh, 
of crime management or justice. Yes. They should be, we should be able to divert them, to change their, uh, to cancel them, and then reintegrate them within society. I, I think we are going to do that. Just like this kid who was going around with eggs. Egg. Uh, it was called the egg what? Or the egg boy or something like that. In town here, we decided to have that kid and talk to the kid and cancel the kid. It's not a, a matter of, you know, get him and, you know, criminalize him. He must be working with some people behind him who are giving him e eggs and who are sending him to different locations. But by talking to the kid, I instructed the, our people at C C uh, CPS to make sure that this kid is, uh, is uh, counseled, mentored, and then reintegrated in society. So we shall have our, our funds uh, to do that, but we also need more support to be able to do this. I'm sorry I've talked a lot, but um, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited of the, uh, on this. And Mubiru, uh, if, uh, if they ask me what happened to the vehicle, or, it's being used for something else, you will be in trouble with me. <laughs> you will be in trouble with me. Thank you so much and may God bless you.